Hey there, enthusiasts. Welcome back to Hero Talk. I am your host. I am the law. I am Judge Greg. And for this episode, we're going to join me and the Black Dragon himself, Vernon, in our discussion in progress on 1990s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So sit back and enjoy Hero Talk. Nineteen nineties Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles live action film directed by the relatively obscure Steve Barron, who went on to do nothing you would have ever heard of after this. <laughs> I looked him up. Oh, that's sad. He's done nothing. He did like I think he did the Coneheads movie and he did that live action Pinocchio with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. Well, hey, well that's stuff that you've heard of. <laughs> or that I've heard of. Right, but it's stuff you wish you hadn't heard of. Or that Pinocchio movie kicked ass. I'm sure it did at the time at the time okay <laughs> I'm, I'm just and gonna Cone, and coneheads dan Aykroyd, are you kidding coneheads was kind of funny i'll i'll, I'll give it that dan Aykroyd yeah. is funny so you shut your mouth sir <laughs> all right all right so let's talk about it and in case you haven't seen the movie yet at once again i'd like to remind you this is a spoiler filled podcast we will spoil everything and anything about this movie we might even spoil another movie for you hey Guess what? Soylent Green is people. <laughs> and thank you for tuning in so you could be spoiled all over. Yes. So, I'm Bruce Willis, he was dead the whole time. <laughs> the whole movie. He's been dead. I, you know what? Let's just spoil every movie right here, right? <laughs> sure, why not? Uh, um, let's see. Snape, Planet of the Apes. Snape, yeah. They were they were on Earth. It was Earth. What? Yeah. Snape kills, Snape Snape kills Dumbledore. Dumbledore. Snape does kill Dumbledore. Yeah. Oh, but Snape, he was uh he was a good guy the whole movie. But whole time. he was a good guy the whole the time. The whole he time he was a cover. good guy. Yeah. He killed Dumbledore just to maintain his cover. And I have nothing else, but I will say that the new Turtles movie will suck. So let's go back to a classic, right. shall we? So let's go to a classic. Yeah, that's actually one of my talking points. So here we go. Um, I'm trying to figure out like how I wanted to present the cast. So I've decided I'm going to present it the way it was actually headlined with Judith Hogue starring Body. as April O'Neil. Uh huh. Elias uh, Codius, I think that's how you say that. I'm sorry, Elias. I'm assuming he's listening. Uh, as Casey <laughs> Jones, uh, who, by the way, just got himself a brand new series. Uh, oh yeah. He's on Chicago PD. Oh okay. Yeah. Well, the spinoff of uh, Chicago Fire. So good on him. And James Sato as the Shredder. And the Ninja <laughs> Turtles were four masterpieces of the Jim Henson workshop. Absolutely. Definitely love the animatronics with that, and I feel so sad in my heart that they just got lazier and lazier over the next two movies. Well, I don't know if they got lazier lazier as the uh, the budget became less and less. <laughs> as the, the original turtle suits for the first movie, those took 18 weeks to make. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did not know that. But you know what? It shows because they look fantastic. They look, fa they, you know, as, as ridiculous a statement as this is going to be, they look exactly how I would expect giant walking turtles to look. <laughs> yeah. Definitely appreciate that comment. Thank you, sir. Yes. Not weird at all. Yeah, not weird at all. So this, the whole movie, it's based off of the uh, the comic book um, and the cartoon show, actually. Uh, Vernon, were you a fan of the cartoon or the comic book before you saw uh, this? The cartoon, I did not, I've never read the comic, and actually, I, I it's on my list of things to do, but um, I, I hear that the, uh, that the comic book was a lot uh, bloodier. Then, uh, then, yeah, depicted, the, then depicted in the cartoon show. The, and... the comic book was sort of meant to skew more adult than the cartoon show was. Okay. Now, I I used to watch the cartoon all the time. You know, it was mm. the the, ni the late nineteen eighties. That's that's what you did. Of course. So I I didn't really have a lot of familiarity with the comics, and so I remember when you go into the movie and they make changes from the cartoon show, you're like, what's going on? <laughs> I I later learned I later learned that like what they basically did is they took the story of the original comic book and they took the story from the cartoon show and they kind of mashed them together to kind of make um, an amalgamized version so that fans of either one would at least have something recognizable that they could relate. Right. Uh, so, like, in the comic book, April wasn't a reporter. She uh, she ran the pawn shop, which she did in the movie, but then she was also, like, a lab assistant for, if you remember, Baxter Stockman. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. uh, so, so we have we have a few different elements from both right. the the comic and the television show meshed into one. Which again, I got to read the comic, but 
I definitely like the darker uh, the darker elements of it. Right. Because um, it goes from humorous to really violent. Yeah, it got pretty dark. In fact, the reason why there were no action figures based off of this particular movie was because mm-hmm. Playmates was like it's t- it's too dark and violent. We we don't want to we don't want to make action figures off of it. I believe that. Yeah. I believe that, yeah. Now, at the time, like, a lot of parents were upset. I think my parents were a little upset that there was a lot of cursing. I know I definitely walked out of the movie saying, damn, damn, all the time. <laughs> my parents were like, no, you can't. I know I know. Raphael says that. You can't say that. You know what? Like, growing up, when I go back to watch it, I kind of appreciate it that they didn't try to kitty it up a little bit. Uh-huh. Yeah, kitty, up, kitty it up too much because a lot of... Uh... A lot of franchises tended to do that when they were geared towards kids and stuff like that. They were either too kitty or just way too cheesy. Yeah. So now you have, you know sense. you have this movie they did a good job mixing the origins. Um, even the origin of Splinter, which is the one that really kind of boggled my mind a little bit, because in the comic book Splinter was in fact he was the rat. He was Hamato Yoshi's rat, and he learned it by mimicking the moves in his cage. Yeah. And then they eliminated the character of Oroko Nagi. And Oroko Nagi, I believe, was Oroko Saki's, I think, older brother or father, and I forget the exact details. But the story goes that Hamato Yoshi killed Oroko Nagi, then fled to America, and Oroko Saki came back to get revenge in America. That makes more sense than the love of a woman. Yeah. They decided that they, they didn't want to... I, I guess maybe you don't want to introduce too many brand new elements into the story for most people so like we'll just we'll just keep it pretty simple like we don't want to introduce Oroko Nagi just to kill him off even though they were willing to introduce the the woman just to kill her off so I guess well I mean it's either it's either the woman or the brother I mean which would you prefer yeah I think they went with the one that didn't make Hamato Yoshi uh, a murderer there you go (laughs) we're doing this for the kids people yeah so he, he could at least be unambiguously good there you go yeah so Let's talk about these puppeteers for a minute. Like, these guys killed it portraying martial arts moves and everything, wearing what I have to assume are, like, 60-pound costumes. They have to be, especially with those shells. Yeah. I mean, these... I I think they did a phenomenal job. I've been actually trying to find some measurement of how heavy the costumes were, and they don't they don't really say a whole lot. Like, they, they give estimates that go, like, 60 to 80 pounds, but I haven't able to actually pinpoint an exact uh, an exact weight of them. But, I mean, these guys are doing flips, and they're jumping all over the place, and they're, you know, they're doing kicks, and they're basically, they are appearing to keep up with the live-action counterpieces in the scenes in which they're engaging in physical combat. Yeah, and they do a very good job. I love I love a lot of the fight scenes in this movie. Yeah, I mean, every every fight scene was done well enough that you enjoyed it. And, like, they slapsticked it a little bit, but, like, at the same time, I mean, these guys were, you know, there was they were actually fighting. There was real fights going on at the time, so. And no CGI, folks. No CGI, which is why you can watch it today and not be completely taken out of it when you watch, you know, the Turtles. In fact, I just recently today saw a side-by-side of Michelangelo from the 1990 movie and Michelangelo from the 2014 movie. And okay. the 1990 movie still looks more real than the 2014 one. Well, I think we've, I mean, I think we've evolved past puppets and stuff like that and, and animatronics to, you know, because animatronics are are great. But now I feel like we're relying 100 percent on CGI now. And it does. Yeah. The, the issue with that is that CGI dates itself. As soon as you apply CGI to the movie, you date the extent of the effects that it were capable when you made them. So it's so CGI for the new Turtles movie is not relevant. I agree. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad we're on the same page. Yes. And turtles are not wrecking balls, people. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're, back, to we're the, not, back to the topic. <laughs> back to the topic at hand. So, Vernon, were you aware that each of the puppeteers, like the bodysuit puppeteers, the guys in the suit, not the face guys, the guys in the suit, had a cameo in the movie, not as a turtle? I did not know that. You did not. So, I was glad I was able to bring something to this. Yeah, each guy um, had a role outside of the turtle suit in the movie. For example, I'll go through them because eh, it's fun. Oh my God, can I take a guess real quick? Sure. The cab driver. No. But the guy in the back of the cab. Yes! I was close. Yes, the guy in the back of the cab was Raphael. And in fact, it was Josh Payas, I believe is his name, who was mm-hmm. both the voice and the in-suit actor for Raphael. Nice. He's the only one who actually had the, was the same guy for the voice and the in-suit actor. Uh, Where did they come up with this stuff? <laughs> 
uh, Michelangelo, his actor, was the Domino's Pizza delivery guy. Oh, my God. They had interactions with themselves? <laughs> yes, that's right. Leonardo, he uh, he played one of the uh, the gang members in the big fight with Tatsu and Casey Jones when they were rescuing yes. Splinter. I think he helped pick somebody up. He was just sort of there. <laughs> and then Donatello. This one I got to fe- kind of feel bad for because uh, the Donatello actor... I'm gonna I'm gonna Leaf Tilden. I'm gonna mention his name. He's a he does a lot of like motion capture stuff. Uh, he did appear as another character outside of the turtle suit, but he was still in a mask because he was a member of the Foot Clan. Uh, he was the one who told Miss O'Neill that he had a message for her, and then smacked her. Oh, so wow. got to appear outside of the suit, but still nobody gets to see his face. Uh, wow, I think actually you know what Donatello was the uh, was one of the was actually the only turtle who had a voice actor as well as a in-suit guy, right? No, uh, uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo had both uh, a voice actor and an in-suit guy. Raphael had just the same guy did both. Well, no, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is that Corey Feldman voiced Donatello, correct? He did, yes. But he wasn't the... Yeah, he was not in the suit. All he did was provide his voice. But they did that with, like, Brian Tochi did the voice for Leonardo, but he had nothing to do with the... He was not in the suit. He was not okay. in the suit. Okay. Um, I... Okay. So, <laughs> My bad. speaking of guys in the suit and guys doing the voices, do you happen to know who uh, did all of the uh, the head and voice work for Splinter? I thought it was all done by uh, Jim, Ten- Jim Henson Company. It was. Do you know Do you know who? Which actor? No, no. Kevin Clash. I feel like I should know who that is. That's Elmo. <laughs> Splinter was Elmo. Aww, it makes me happy and sad because <laughs> I think really? about what's hap- what's happened with Elmo recently. Yeah. So, well, not Elmo personally. <laughs> not not the actual puppet, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, just just leave the puppet out of it. But the anyway. <laughs> so that's all right. So that's um, it as far as my uh, cameos that ruin your childhood. Th- thank you for that. I have a whole new level of just. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Anyway. There's, I mean, there's, a, uh, there's a lot going on with this movie. Uh, do you know, most of it was filmed in North Carolina. Really? Yeah, like, anytime they needed, like, an actual, like, New York backdrop or some some actual monument uh, or landmark, they would go to New York and film. But otherwise, it was North Carolina, which I imagine probably gave tax credits for filming there. Because that's, oh, sure. that's why they do stuff like that. And you never hear of filming in North Carolina, so that's new to me. Yeah. I mean, that's what... That's why they film in Toronto all the time. Oh, no, definitely believe it. Let's talk uh, one more note on on production. Uh, Did you know that there was a significant controversy with this film? Because Michelangelo traditionally uses uh, nunchucks. Nunchucku, if you like to to say them that way. I don't. And the, the problem with nunchucks is that in most places, nunchucks are illegal. So in England, they had to sort of cut any use of him with the nunchucks, which is sad because that means they missed the whole, you know, nunchuck duel. I don't, I don't understand, like, the, you know, people allow swords and knives, but nunchucks? Yeah, nunchucks, <laughs> uh, in fact. Are, are banned or something? Yeah, they're banned, and they're illegal in a lot of places. And when when the, uh, the the Ninja Turtles, when they had the live action show, yeah. which I think was in the late 90s, which was... Ooh, I, I remember that. It was, was like a rock show awful. or something. Yeah, and then there was a fifth turtle, and it was, it was pretty bad. Oh, yeah, on Fox Kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so Michelangelo, he wasn't allowed to use nunchucks on that show because by that point, nunchucks had been made illegal in New York State. Yeah. Uh, class A misdemeanor for possession. <laughs> so he he had, to, I think he used like some ball and chain thing, but okay. but it was uh, it made a pretty big controversy because everyone didn't like him using the nunchucks. Oh, poor Michelangelo. So poor Michelangelo. All right, so let's talk story. So we got four turtles get uh get covered in green stuff, turn into mutant turtles. Like you do. Well, yeah. I don't know. Like, how do you think the story went as far as, like, you know, knowing what you knew about the cartoon? How do you think the story related? Um, in terms of the turtles touching goo and, you know, <laughs> Splinter touching goo, yeah. I don't remember too much about the cartoon, um, except for the fact that they like pizza and the, you know, turtle power and the theme song. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, you know, touching goo and turning into mutant turtles that, you know, are depicted as teenagers. Yeah. And uh, Splinter was actually a human in the cartoon before he turned into a mutant rat. Yeah. But in this, like you said, it's closer to the comic book where he's an actual rat who mimicked ninjutsu form and style in his cage before touching the goo with the turtles and turning into an intellectual rat. Right. It, it, it really sobers you up to the prospect of potentially ninja rats out there somewhere, because if Splinter mm. learned it by mimicking from his cage, I mean, who's to say there aren't some other rats out there that mimicked? 
I'd believe it. Yeah. I mean, that's why I lock my doors at night. Right. As well you should, because there's ninja rats out there. Sir. I, I will say, though, I prefer the Splinter was a rat who turned into a mutant rather than a human that turned into a rat. Because if you're a human and you turn into a mutant rat, why would you decide to call yourself Splinter? I don't know why uh, <laughs> why it's any different than a rat being named Splinter. Well, because the rat itself didn't have a name, or maybe it was named Splinter. But, like, I mean, you imagine something happens to you, like, wow, I got changed completely. Well, I'm not going to call myself Vernon anymore. <laughs> well, no, obviously, I'd, I'd call myself Andros. Exactly. That's... I mean, it, for, for, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, and let's just move on. All right. So we got the, the Turtles, and then Shredder, and the Foot Clan, and so what did you think of Shredder? Um, I thought he was uh, a little too colorful, but badass at the same time, so he kind of just pulled it off. When you mean a little too cover- colorful, are you referring to literally the color that... Literally the color of his outfit. He was a bit purple. Like, he is fresh off the performance stage at Copacabana. <laughs> and, and, I, and sparkly, I, too, I, if I remember. It was purple really and sparkly. sparkly. Yeah. <laughs> And, I mean, with the blades and everything and, and the helmet and everything, it looks cool. His voice is awesome, but that suit was really bright for a ninja. It, it was. Uh, in his defense, he didn't do a whole lot of ninjaing himself. He dropped out of nowhere at the end of the movie. He did. He was. They were on top of a building, and he somehow dropped on them. I mean, it was cool, but where did he come from? Yeah. But that's what ninjas do. Yeah. I, he, I, he looked the part, though. I, I will say that. Money cannot buy the <laughs> honor you have earned here tonight. I, I, I'm sorry, I have so many lines memorized. I may just quote. I may just quote the whole movie before we're done with this. He, I mean, he, I think I think he did a good job. I I thought it was a little. You know, this is just a cliche, so I can't hold that against this movie per se. But yeah. like when he gets the news on the TV that he doesn't like, so he throws the knife at it. You're like, <laughs> what exactly did that accomplish? You know I mean, you're just going to have to send so people to steal another that, one of those. Right. He's got so many and and access to people who can get more. So, you know, he can just, he can afford that. I just, you know, it doesn't seem like a ninja would have that kind of discipline issue where he would have to. Ah, but he's not a true ninja because he trusted in, in rage and, and actual strength rather than Splinter's lesson, which real strength comes from the mind. And now you know, kids. And knowing is half the battle. Oh, boy. That's a that's a different hero talk. <laughs> Come on, that was awesome. Yeah. All right, so we have we have Shredder, who looked great. Um, April O'Neil, uh, with Judith Hogue, who did not return for the sequels. Hottie. I'm sorry, she was a little hottie back then. Oh, all right. That was, and even still now. That got that got a little weird. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Well, I mean, listen. I will. I will say she is. She is a handsome woman. <laughs> <laughs> Way to play it safe. <laughs> yes, she's a uh, okay. she's a handsome woman. Um, who's uh, I think she's in that new show Nashville. Uh, so I stay away from that show. Yeah, I'm just saying. I I try to look up like where these people are these days. Oh yeah. Uh, and I th- yeah I think she was in the new show Nashville. So it's always good to like. I get really sad when I see like this person is like, oh, in 1990 and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they're next appeared in nothing. <laughs> so blank. Yeah, so it makes me feel good when like they've been in stuff, but like she is in the she's in so much stuff. She does like guest appearances on shows all the time, and she's been in a bunch of made for TV movies and some indie movies and some small parts and large releases. So uh, Judith Hogue, working actress. I think she was. I think she killed it as April O'Neil. She covered exactly what I would want my April O'Neil to do in terms of you're not just being the uh oh I'm helpless uh oh save me turtles and especially when she has a lot of scenes where it is just her and she needs to act off of four animatronic puppet turtles <laughs> and that's what you and, have to go off and she does well and she does quite well. And it's actually, there are some really funny scenes with her and the turtles, and, and she's, like, dreaming, and she's making all these asides. <laughs> um, Can I do another one? You may do another one. Why don't I ever dream of Harrison Ford? Harrison Ford. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I thought it was it was quite funny. And plus, it gives us a, a point of view character so that Splinter can play the, the exposition game. With with the little flashbacks over his shoulder, which was actually pretty cool. And, uh, and the, as an adult, I think it's kind of weird. As an adult, I would I don't know I I like I like the effect. I like it better than just I'm gonna talk to you. Well, go into full flashback or don't. Yeah, I, it was a creative I've choice. Grown, I've grown to 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 enjoy either the full flashback or just an explanation. Director Steve Barron made a a very bold choice, which is 
was he was noted for in his work. I'm sure that I that I can agree with you. On. Yeah, it was a it was a bold choice. Uh, but she is our eyes and ears into the turtles' right. lives. Which, but it's interesting that it's not about her, though. Right. I mean, it's it, that's an issue you have in movies like this, is you need your point of view character because yeah. you have to introduce us to the oddity of these four. Because they're not going to explain it to each other. They know. They've been around. So you need somebody <laughs> new. Remember when we craw- when we crawled out of that ooze? Yeah, I mean that's that's what happens in some of these movies where you don't have a point of view character, like in the uh, in episodes one, two, and three of Star Wars, where everyone's just kind of there and the ones getting introduced, and so everyone's just they're giving exposition to each other. Like, shouldn't you guys already know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happens. You, you yeah, know. <laughs> so that's what happens. That's why you have to have a character who needs it explained to them on screen so the exposition doesn't sound stupid. Yes, and it is an interesting telling of their backstory and it didn't get too weird it's just that flashback thing yeah messes with me as an adult right um oddly enough another character who was fresh and introduced to the turtles yet didn't actually ask any questions about where they came from was casey jones well you know you figure you live in new york yeah (laughs) he was clearly born and bred there yeah he was just he shows up and he's like uh sure you're talking turtle in fact he seemed pretty pretty okay with the whole thing (laughs) He was very accepting. <laughs> I, I, you know, as you think about it now, and you look back, you're like, he just looks, and he sees the turtle guy, and he's like, oh, there's my turtle, buddy. Like, it never even occurred to him, and I was like, by the way, the whole turtle thing, um, <laughs> he just he just seemed to be okay with it. Yes, uh, it, it, uh, it's like the uh, it's like the cab driver, just, yeah, look like a giant turtle yes. in, a, uh, in a trench coat. <laughs> you, you go on LaGuardia, right? Yeah. And, and that, that's it, that's all we hear about yeah. it. He doesn't <laughs> comment anymore. You, you gotta love that. I, I, I quite enjoy that scene. I actually, I enjoyed Casey Jones. I thought, you know, I, I came from the cartoon where he did not have as big a part as he had in the comic books. So I'm like, it seems kind of arbitrary just to have Casey Jones in there and not any of these other guys. But uh, I don't know, Casey Jones, he added something to it. It was fun to see. I thought he was good. And he, he gave, you know, another person that they could actually work off of instead of, you know, putting poor Judith through, you know, all, all this, all these scenes with just her and, you know, puppets. Yeah, um, and K- and Casey definitely added a, a another another element. Whereas everyone else is kind of shocked. Like we said, he's just like, okay, yeah. um, turtles, ninjas, bring it on. Yeah, he is, however, slightly claustrophobic. <laughs> Are you kidding? He's never even looked at another guy. <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, I thought that was kind of funny. It's probably a line you wouldn't get away with today, but it's still kind of funny. <laughs> And, you know, it took me a while because, you know, I saw it when I was young and I grew up with it. And that was one of the lines in this movie, along with, you know, so many others that I just didn't get until I got older. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you think of? Um, <sighs> I'm totally skipping through my notes because um, there's a bunch of stuff that I wanted to mention. Sure, but sure. the first thing has to be the trench coats. Or the trench coat. Yeah, you know, and... <laughs> it, it was it, the, I, as a kid. I thought it, I thought it was great because that's what they did in the cartoon. So I like genius. They did that here, and then as an adult, I only think it's just it's kind of funny because like because nobody can tell, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's just one of those where it's like there are this movie has enough slapstick and silliness in it that I can accept that he went to see a movie in a trench coat dressed as a turtle and nobody cared. <laughs> And it just it, it it's akin to Superman fooling the entire world with a pair of glasses. Right. It's it's just silly. It's just so silly. And that that's kind that's kind of what makes it funny and ridiculous and stuff like that. So I wanted to bring that up. Um. And uh, oh, I, just a question. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. The tur- the turtles have been watching April O'Neil. They've they've seen her on the news before. That's correct. Yeah. In their tunnel in the sewer that somehow gets reception. I'm assuming they illegally got cable in the 90s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they uh they you know they uh, they recognize her. They obviously know that it's it's her. Um the news reporter who they think is so attractive. Right. So what was Raphael hoping to accomplish by following her? <laughs> it, it's clear that the yeah. turtles were familiar with her work since they watch her regularly on television. Right. But what was he planning to do? And well, did he know, just want I, to get his side back? Like, wasn't that the whole point? He didn't know that. Well, he knew that she took it, but how would he know that she had it on her? Well, uh, Raphael's not exactly the kind of guy to think through a problem. 
True, you know, and and before, you know, I was like, oh, it's it's great that Raph was there to save her, but now I'm thinking it might be a good idea to take him aside and have a long talk, yeah. and no one even like asks like why were you following her <laughs> yeah they, they do they care more about why you brought her back here why you brought her back but they're like then... so why were you following her <laughs> like i'm not or not even not even if you just don't jump to oh you were following her but how did you end up in the same place as her when we were just watching her on tv not too long ago? yeah he's uh yes yeah. just the thing you think about as an adult yeah Raphael, <laughs> slightly stalkerish <laughs> That's that's a recurring theme in these hero talks is that people are stalkerish. Yes, knowing where people yeah. are at all times is yeah. not is not a bad thing. But um, but it was a good thing he was there. Especially, I thought it was a little funny where you would think April O'Neil, especially having just almost been mugged, would think to herself, maybe it's time to get some pepper spray. <laughs> And not ride the subway alone. Not ride the subway alone with this sci I stole as my only form of defense. Or take a cab home. Jeez. Yeah. The sigh. The sigh. During the mugging in the beginning of the movie, Raphael uses the sigh to break the only light in the alley. Right. So that the turtles can come in and save the day. That's cool. Somehow he managed to leave his weapon, even though they managed to beat all that ass <laughs> in the dark. Yeah, it was, it was very... Um irresponsible and not ninja-esque but that's the thing the police just show up like right away police don't respond <laughs> like that okay Nobody called them either that's no, no one called them Nobody exactly called them. <laughs> so he had plenty of time in the dark <laughs> to be like oh let me get my weapon back because i clearly used it to knock out that light and they uh <laughs> it it is it is a little it's it's a little kind of ditzy a little bit like you just got a little <laughs> airheaded there and it's like they were in the sewer and they're like we just want to make sure she's okay and then he doesn't remember until she sees it like oh no my side <laughs> I threw it at that light like twenty minutes ago damn I should have just grabbed it then I I just uh, that that's one thing that I wanted to bring up uh, that is clearly there to you know have them connect paths again because that makes sense what you said about him following her because you know he knows that she has his weapon yeah because I, I hadn't thought of that before back. yeah that's I, I that, that's what of... I always figured it's like he wanted the sigh back so we figured eventually she'll lead him to where the sigh is and he can just take it back yeah but and are they stealthy for turtles yeah they are quite stealthy for turtles. And that is one of the points that I'm, you know, I'm just going to go out on the limb here is, you know, stealth and silence. That's part of being a ninja, yes. not colors, and jokes. Right. What com comes with, you know, future installments, you know, adding a girl to the team. Yeah. You know, he's... a long lost sister. And... I, I will, I think, and I, I, I might be getting these guys mixed up, but I think Kevin Eastman eventually, like, he completely took control of, of the turtles away from Peter Lard or Laird. Uh, <laughs> And uh, Kevin Eastman hates the idea of Venus, and he erased just about every trace of her from any official Ninja Turtle guide or anything. He doesn't even like people talking about her. So I think we can be relatively uh, solid in, in the belief that she's not coming back ever in any imaginable form. Well, never say never, because the entire series that she, was, that she belongs to is on Netflix. It is. I watched um, 12 minutes into it, into the first episode, and I couldn't do it. I had to stop. <laughs> I'm glad you came to your senses 12 yeah. minutes in. Yeah, I, I, I tried. I was like, I gave it a fair shake. I can't do this anymore. I did, however, um, in fact, this is the only episode of that show that I actually saw on its original air date, the crossover between the Ninja Turtles and the Power Rangers and in Power Space. Rangers in space. <laughs> Because Power Rangers in Space was my shit back then. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. they combined it with Ninja Turtles. Yeah, they combined it with Ninja Turtles in some ridiculous scene where some monster is, like, rocking the Power Rangers world, and the Ninja Turtles show up and do some unnecessary gymnastic things to shoot the monster's beam back at him with the sword and... I don't. I don't know. I think that seemed a little off to me. But oh, you you mean like shell surfing and being a wrecking ball to a Humvee? Yes. Yes. I'm gonna keep bringing it up because I think it's the dumbest thing ever. It's a little silly. <laughs> but then again, you know what about Ninja Turtles? Yeah, I mean so. it's. Yeah, I that it's probably gonna suck. So you had mentioned that um, there was a lot of slapstick, and uh, you know, again earlier we had said that 
uh, while there's a lot of slapstick, it turns from, you know, kind of, you know, more 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 or less kid friendly to just straight up violent. Um I mean it gets pretty bad. Like that beat down of Raphael is brutal. Oh my God. <laughs> it is brutal. <laughs> they are beating the crap out of him. <laughs> It is very violent for a movie based on a show meant for kids. Right. I mean, like he. I mean, he does all right, and then like all these other guys show up, and then you're kind of like, I wonder how Raphael is going to get out of this, and he's not. Like he gets the talk <laughs> kicked out of him and thrown back into the apartment. And thrown back into the, the apartment, the... which then leads to a pretty decent fighting scene. Um, honestly, with Casey Jones showing up and. Oh yeah, I mean that that that's that fight scene. Besides the end fight scene, was one of my favorites. Yeah, I quite liked it. But I mean, it eventually results in the Turtles having to leave and go to April's farm, which is apparently a storyline taken right out of the comic book. Really? Yeah, that almost like exactly happens like that, where I don't know, I think it might have been Leonardo instead of Raphael who got beat up. But uh, yeah. basically the same thing happens. The foot come in, they attack them there, they set the place on fire, and they leave and go to April's farm to kind of regroup before they come back uh, to, to New York to take on the foot. So that was actually like almost directly out of the comic book. Oh well, that's good. Did they do it well then? Um, I think so. I didn't really. I didn't. Oh, I, for, I was under the impression you read the comic. No, book. no, no. I've I am familiar with the comic book and some of the storylines from it. Yeah. But when I started reading the comic, it was I was long past the point. Like it was it wasn't even with Image Comics anymore. It's when Archie Comics picked it up, and it was a whole different beast then. Okay. Uh, okay. But I'm just kind of familiar with some of the storylines from there. But, And in the midst of this, we've kind of glossed over this, but then there's this whole side plot with April's boss and his son. Yeah, Danny. And, okay, so a April's boss, uh, Charles. Yeah. Uh, he has a son, Danny, who's pretty much a delinquent. He's been in and out of jail because he's been, you know, working with the foot. So, um, you know, meanwhile, you know, uh, Charles is getting pressure because, uh, April's pushing all the right buttons, apparently. Yeah, so Chief yeah, Stearns pulled that one out. Chief Stearns ends up, like, really riding against her and, and puts the pressure to get her fired. Mm. So. So, apparently after, you know, April telling him how to do his job! <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that was the, that was apparently the last straw, yeah. so he uses, uh, he uses Charles' son to, to, to get her out of there, but it's, you know, that, that is an interesting, uh, side plot, because it's, you have someone that's directly involved with it, um, with the Foot Clan, um, and someone who's connecting the direct connection to the Foot Clan to someone who's trying to find out about the Foot Clan. Right. And yet again, another individual who can give Splinter an excuse for exposition. Oh yeah, um, and kind of plays like a like an advisor or somewhat of a a, a removed father. Right. Or what a, a, an example of what a fa a good father could be. Right. Yeah. Now Just I think listening to him. I think in our discussion here, we've maybe we've glossed over one more character who I think at least deserves a little bit of 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 time here, and that is Tatsu. Really? Well, I, interestingly enough about Tatsu, the uh, something that he shares in common with the Ninja Turtles in this movie is that he has both a body actor and a voice actor. <laughs> Cuz apparently Toshishiro Obata does not speak a lick of English. So they had somebody else dubbing his voice. Okay. Yeah. I, I believe that. Also, that scene where like he whips the living tar out of that one kid in the Foot Clan? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I guess that kid was supposed to die. Oh wow! I just thought he was critically injured. Yeah, he was. I think he was supposed to die, but then like the test audiences thought that was a little too dark, so they added all that that footage later. He he'll be, he's gonna be okay. Yeah. Like that was added later. Like he was supposed to just be like, I just straight up got mad and killed you. Oh wow! So that you know, okay, yeah, that that. Uh, wow, man, I'm learning a lot about this. Yeah, there was. I mean, there was a lot to this movie. So good old tattoo. Okay, so tattoo. He. Uh, uh, I never liked this character. Well, I mean, I, I know he's the second in command and everything yeah. like that, but I never, I never, I never liked him. You know, I think at the time I was like, I don't know why they didn't do like Bebop and Rocksteady, but looking back at it now, I'm like, I'm kind of glad they just went with like somebody else. Uh, he was there. I mean, he gave Casey something to do while the turtles were all doing their stuff. Uh, yeah, and Casey fighting ninjas. He had a golf club. Apparently, that's all you really need to make Casey Jones on the level of highly trained ninjas <laughs> is sporting goods material. And he held all of them off in the middle of a fire. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Yeah, well, because yeah. he had a hockey stick. Ah. Mm. And if you're Casey Jones with a hockey stick, you are as adept at fighting as any ninja training anyone could come up with. 
Well, who needs ninja training when you're from the streets of New York City? He has a hockey stick. He's probably a Rangers fan, which is sad, but... And and uh, Jose Canseco fan. Yeah, no, l- 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 let's save that. That's another That's another thing that we're going to talk about later. <laughs> okay, next topic. <laughs> so next, all right, so the Turtles come back to New York. They find Danny. Then big ending fight scene. I loved that whole scene. I loved Absolutely. every part of it. Absolutely. It was funny. It was cool. Yeah. And just, you know, the, the final confrontation confrontation with Shredder was awesome. Right. Shredder looking fabulous shows up. So fabulous. Shows up. And I mean, he rocks their world in a way that really makes him seem because up until this point, you understand, we haven't seen Shredder do a thing. Yeah. He walks around. He looks menacing. He has tattoo fixes cape. That's what we've seen so far. <laughs> And so, you know, yeah, at this point he hasn't done anything, but, you know, he's like the final boss. Right. And then... It has to be devastating. Right. And he goes out there, and then, you know, he finally gets... Uh, who was it? Michelangelo, or was it Leonardo that he finally, like, kind of catches in his spear tip there? Oh, uh, Leonardo. Leonardo, that's right. And he has the other guys throw their weapons, um, which I don't know why they think that would work. Like, this guy's clearly a dick. Well, true, but you have to ask the question... Why didn't they all just attack him at once in the first place? That's true. They, uh, In fact, at one point, they even like were, were rock, paper, scissoring for who would face him next. It's like, just go together. Yeah. And I, I think at best they did two at a time at one point, but like they never, even Shredder's like, you understand that all of you could just join up and beat me. And he even <laughs> says it. He like, says yeah, it. Yeah, he, he says said, it to them. Like, you could have just overpowered me and only lost one guy. So it, it's almost like they didn't think of that because they just, they don't, they never fought anybody that hard before. You know what I was thinking um, as I was watching it today um, at work? <laughs> All right. Nonetheless, because I, uh, I, I had nothing to do. Um, well, because I'm a good employee. I finish all my work early. Right, of course. So. <laughs> I'm totally um, buying that. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, I, you know, why, why did they just, like, go one at a time? You know, maybe it's a ninja, like, honor thing. Like, you know, one-on-one. You both have your weapons, so you both have a fighting chance, and just go at it. That's that's not and really how ninjas work, though. Ninjas, but I mean, yeah, n- ninjas that's... are like cheap shotting, cheating, take every advantage you can get. Like that's the ninja way. Well, you know what? Maybe I misspoke. The warrior. The warrior. Okay. The the warrior. You know, one on one. You both have your weapons. Go at it. May the best win. Um. But then I'm like, no, that can't be it because they ganged up on Raphael. They ganged up on all the turtles at one point. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't until they came back that they were able to actually like, you know, form a unit and hold their own against the foot and dominate the, you know, the, the foot soldiers. Um, but yeah, like the, the foot ganged up on them. Why not gang up on Treader? Yeah, it was, it was really, it was a, it was a bad call. And I think that's what happens when you send teenagers to do the work of an adult brat. <laughs> With nothing but a quick move to the left and a pair of nunchucks. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> Splinter Splinter really made Shredder look like a tool. Right <laughs> and he flopped over the side like a rag doll. <laughs> he flops over the side. And he's, Splinter's all like, was that so hard? <laughs> oh, man. But, yeah, he embarrassed. And then, of course, because Shredder has to be the master of his own fate, besides, I'm going to throw a knife at Splinter. Because I apparently really don't like these scratches on my face. <laughs> and I, he just completely loses his composure from the battle before. Yeah. He's like, oh, you rat, you got free and did this to me. I don't understand why he didn't just exact his revenge then. No, he took his ear and then he left. Because that's what I would have done if a rat jumped up and <laughs> scratched my face. <laughs> well, <laughs> not not back then, back then, but like he had Splinter captive. Right. But I guess he didn't know that it was the same rat. I think that's the point. Like, because it wasn't until, like, Splinter said, like, you know, at the home of my master, Hamato Yoshi, that he realized this is the rat. But, like, you think he would be like, huh, I remember intentionally going out of my way to cut the ear off of a rat. And now I have an adult rat here that somehow knows the fighting style of my old man, of, like, of one of somebody I once knew, my old friend, Hamato Yoshi, also missing that part of the ear. Wow, that's a phenomenal coincidence. (laughs) <laughs> like, so yeah that's yeah he kind of just killed himself like all good villains right do. Kill, he he essentially killed himself but really he fell into garbage and casey jones decided you know what i haven't done yet i haven't murdered <laughs> well 
Well, actually, you know what? Casey Jones might have murdered Shredder, but he's been beating thugs with bats and hockey sticks. I'm surprised he hasn't done it already. Yeah, but he, I mean, he seemed very nonchalant about the whole thing. Like, Just, oops, oops, you're dead now. <laughs> Just gonna kill you. I mean, if he wasn't dead already from that drop, because you'd have to drop perfectly into right. that to the back of that thing to not die immediately yeah and then... but i mean like he i mean he's straight up just like well i figure i'm just gonna kill him now like we're not gonna try to get him arrested and he's not gonna face just i'm just gonna kill him <laughs> so there's a little bit respectable about that and like where he's like listen this guy nothing is gonna stick in court um he's right. probably just gonna escape i don't want to be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life i'm just gonna hit this little lever here and all our problems are just gonna go away which of course they don't which they don't but it was a good shot. Of course, for Casey, they did, because he never saw Shredder again. Right, exactly. So, for, as far as Casey's concerned, he's like, good to... I wonder how the police reacted, though. And wh why did the truck compact him? Uh, <laughs> that was an accident. No one asks questions after the villain's dead. Yeah, like, the, really? Because just... we have 30 witnesses here who say that you <laughs> flipped that switch. Nobody saw nothing. <laughs> Like you made a you made a big production out of it too, as they describe it to me. It was. <laughs> it doesn't help your case that you yelled "oops" yeah. and like so nonchalantly flipped. It. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty cold for a kids movie. That's what I'm saying. It's so violent. <laughs> yeah. So, but anyway, that's where the movie ends. Although Vernon, have you ever seen the alternate ending? Oh my god, there's an alternate ending? There's an alternate, well, I would say an alternate ending. It takes place after this, but this was not supposed to be the last scene. Okay. There's another scene beyond that where, like, April it takes her, uh, she's in some, like, skyscraper uh, office, and I think she's in, like, a comic book or a cartoon office or something, and she has her drawings of the turtles, and yep. she's pitching the idea of, like, a TV show or movie or comic book of these turtles. Oh. Into the guy, and the guy's like, I don't know. It all seems pretty far fetched, or something along those lines. They very specifically use the word far fetched, and then there's this funny scene where like the turtles are looking in on the little meeting, like which is on a skyscraper in the middle of the day, so it doesn't really scream ninja to me. Wait, how are they looking? I, I guess I'd have to Google this. You'd have to Google. It. Yeah, they're like they're peeking their heads because like the windows behind the guy, and they're peeking their heads yeah. in from the corners of the window. Okay. It's uh, it doesn't look like it would work at all, and like it looks like it it looks like they're they're, they're somewhere around like twenty stories up. So you're like, how did you get up there in broad daylight where anyone can look up and see you? <laughs> just to see how April's meeting went, can't you just ask her? Sure, sure. Afterwards, yeah. But that would be too normal. Right. So they very intelligently decided to cut that scene and just end it there that night. With, you know, the T U R T L E power song. Half Shell, Heroes yeah. 4. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. No. Um. Um, one thing I'm going to say, though, the, I don't care what that song says. Raphael is not the leader of the group. He, Raphael is not the leader. Okay, let's get that straight. That's, let's settle every fifth grade argument that I had that year. Raphael is not the leader, no matter what the song says. Leonardo is the leader of the group. Um, actually, before before we wrap up, there's one yeah. thing that I actually wanted to bring up earlier um, about Danny. Oh, Danny. Um, was he one of the ninjas that attacked April and followed Raphael back to their home? No, no. Um, Danny knew the turtles were there because he caught a glimpse of, I think, Michelangelo in the shower. It didn't lead to their home, though. And that, if I'm not mistaken... Uh, oh, let me. Uh, it's. Oh, let me think. Because that yeah. that scene where he catches a glimpse of the turtles, that scene happens after they after they lost Splinter. Oh, that's right. So I don't think Danny was supposed to be one of the ones that followed them back to their home. Yeah, that's what it's. That's what it seems like though, because um, he's the one that raises his hand in the in the, right. Be he does I that because he me. saw the turtles in April's apartment. That's the reason why they go to April's apartment apartment and take on Raphael. That was only after they had lost their home they had lost splinter that's that's what i'm trying to figure out because okay she there's a there's one of the um soldiers that follows Raphael right. back home and then we have that you know that meeting where the shredder walks in and he starts addressing all the teenagers and then danny raises his hand um when he mentions the turtles and and then we get um the uh them i guess hanging out with april and then they go home and see splinter's gone and then go back to april's and then you know, Charles and Danny come over, and then he sees Michelangelo, no, I, and he's like, holy shit. <laughs> I'm remembering it being more along the lines of, guy follows them home, 
uh, they take Splinter while they're all hanging out with April. So they go back to April and they're like, Splinter's gone. And then the next day, her boss shows up with Danny. And then Shredder's like, okay, so I got the rat. Now I want to find out where the turtles are. And that makes sense that they would that he would you know yeah. give them a heads up that the turtles are there. Right. But I I'm I, I'm curious because I was thinking about that earlier and maybe I need to watch it again. But I swear that that that, that scene of events played out the way that I just described it. And uh, but that would but my, my follow up question to that would be is that why he's hanging out with Splinter because he feels guilty because he gave up their home? Uh. And maybe. that's because because he they find him there later. How did yeah. he know about that plate? Yeah, that's, he must have talked to Splinter about it. Honestly, that's I. He he should have no reason to know where that place is, other than right, that's what it, Splinter that's what says. Saying, never... By the way, what you do is uh, you have to go underneath the grate at one twenty four and an eighth. <laughs> and that's the thing too is that he when Danny returns, he's like, I haven't seen you for a while. Where have you been? And Danny's kind of vague about it. Yeah. He's like, Yeah, I've just been you know hiding out. Um, so unless there's a conversation that we hadn't seen, I don't think Splinter would have given up their old home location unless another foot soldier you know yeah told them about maybe it, they all knew that... about it like they all knew that there was this thing in the sewers that they all went to and it was just sort of common knowledge or sam rockwell told them i don't know <laughs> and can we just acknowledge that sam rockwell has four scenes in this movie yeah it was uh killer this was before killer. and i didn't i didn't know who sam rockwell was at the time of course you know because i'm a kid and yeah. I don't really care. He's just an extra in a movie. Um, but, you know, of course, one time I'm watching this in my college years, and I'm like, is that is that Sam Rockwell? That's Sammy Rockwell. <laughs> Gotta check the east side of Lairdman Island. <laughs> You'll get your answers get there. Get your answers there. And the cop's like, oh, I'm satisfied oh, with that. okay. <laughs> no reason to keep you in custody now. <laughs> just sending me to some random warehouse across town. <laughs> Clearly, that's a right. tip I should follow up on on faith. Well, see, Greg, what, what we've learned from before with the death of Shredder in, at the hands of Casey Jones is that you don't ask questions, yes, don't ask questions. <laughs> after the after the resolution of the story. Yes. It's like, I don't think I understand. <laughs> All the ninjas are down, so don't ask too many questions. I, I do like how he's like, at least Chief Stern sounds like he wants to get everybody like, get those guys over there. Get these guys yeah. here. What is going on? Why are there ninjas all over? <laughs> he did at least seem appropriately disheveled. And not like he was bought by the Foot Clan. Right. So Vernon. kind of assumed before. Vernon, what's, yes. your, what's your favorite part of this movie? Um, mm. Oh, God, there's so many good parts. Um, I'd have to say when the, the, the fight at the end is a close second. Yep. But I'm going to have to go for the very beginning, right after they save April from the mugging. Oh. The opening title sequence. Very well done. It's my, is my favorite scene in this movie. An excellent um, introduction. Built the tension and perfect. And it, it's just so awesome. And it, it's my favorite scene to to this day, over two decades later. Um, and it, the when I say dudes and dudettes in my videos, you know where I get yeah. that from. Major, Major League, League butt, butt kicking, kicking is back, is in, back town. in town. <laughs> All right. So, oh, man. what about you? My favorite scene, as as I I kind of alluded to earlier, is Casey Jones and Raphael in the park. <laughs> I love that scene. I love everything about it. I love a Jose Canseco bat, and he looks. He's like, "Tell me you didn't pay money for this." <laughs> for this. And they just, you just, you laugh. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, and then then the funny thing is, is that like with the bats, Casey Jones gets owned by Raphael, but it, then he then he pulls out like the cricket paddle. It's like, well, now it's on. <laughs> It's like Casey Jones' skills vary upon whatever instrument of the sport he's on, and certain sports he's better at. Like yeah. like golf, with a golf club, master assassin. <laughs> that puts him on par with... <laughs> puts him on I par with ninjas. the master assassins of the world. But hey, if you need to fight like uh, a mutant ninja humanoid, uh, a cricket paddle is all he needs. He is able to dish <laughs> out the hurt with the cricket paddle. And he sends him flying. He sends him... <laughs> I mean, With it, perfect aim and precision, head first into a trash can. Right. So you don't you don't screw with Casey Jones is what I learned there. Um, if you have like a whole legion of ninjas, Casey just needs he needs a hockey stick, and that's that's, what, that's what he needs, and then he's good. His <laughs> his skill is directly dependent on the instrument that he's using at the given time. But, and we've all learned something. Yeah. Don't mess with Casey Jones. Don't mess with Casey Jones. And I I mean it's funny because like Raphael's like oh you're gonna have a cricket. You gotta know what a crumpet is to understand cricket. <laughs> Casey's like, yeah, you can make jokes 
I'm about to rock your world. <laughs> oh, home run! Yeah. One wins! One nothing! And they even play the music in the back. <laughs> I was, I mean, the, the, that is, if you need to introduce Casey Jones in this movie in a way that makes him relevant, that was the way to do it. Because I, I love the character ever, and I did not like him in the cartoon at all. But when you, in that introduction, I loved him from that moment on. <laughs> so that's, that's my favorite scene. Great introduction, great scene for yeah. Casey and Raphael. I think, uh, I think they're supposed to be like really good friends. Um, from what I've right, I, I'm pretty sure comments. too. Yeah, they they kind of played up the whole Donatello and Casey Jones, but Raphael was in a coma at the time. Yeah, I think he just used and, him as a stand-in because you know Donatello. Apparently, he didn't it, have Donatello time to do really machines, did. so he just did the truck. I guess. Yeah, he he really didn't do anything in this movie except pork rinds. Pork rinds. Pork rinds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or one of the most dated references in the movie is it's kind of like moonlighting, isn't it? <laughs> You're like that's funny now. Even as a kid, I'm like that's funny now. And then I watch it now. I'm like I don't even remember that show. <laughs> oh man, the 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 Walkman. Oh, the what, Walkman. The, this the, was is was it a Walkman or a CD player? It was it was a Walkman. It was not a CD player. He had a Walkman. Okay, your standard because I don't even know where he got those things. It's like they're you can buy those at the dollar store now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> It just shows. It just goes to show, you know, when this came out. It, yeah. It's it's it hilarious. Was, it was. It it took a time capsule of 1990, and it it perfectly the hair and the technology and mm. Casey Jones with the high rise jeans and perfect <laughs> the acid wash high rise jeans too. Absolutely, with the denim vest, <laughs> fingerless gloves. I wanted that that vest. I still want that vest. I think I could rock that vest. Look, no, okay? You're going to set a bad example for your daughter. Oh, yeah, you're right. I shouldn't do that. She's going to join a motorcycle gang. She's, she's not, she's not going to join. All right, so, Vernon, <laughs> what would you score this movie? I would score this 9.5. A 9.5 out, out of 10. I would give it a 4 out of 5 because we can't use the same scale. What? <laughs> we got to gotta use different scales just for... Wait, actually, actually, can I change mine? You can change yours. I would like to do nine and a half shells because it was a shell of a good hit. It was a shell of a good hit. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to give it four Casanovas out of five Bossa Novas. <laughs> and what was he trying to come up with at the end? I don't know. He was just trying to make, say something. That make was, us something. Yeah. It was, I, it was it was a funny gag that I, I'm glad they like they, they kept with. Just that Donatello's really bad at the quips and one-liners. <laughs> But then, like, he will, he'll critique other people's all the time. Like, that's too derivative, too cliche. And the funny thing is, like, those <laughs> words didn't mean anything to me as a kid. And, like, as I watch it now, I'm like, that's actually very poignant criticism. Yeah. Like, that's too derivative. <laughs> that one's too cliche. No, that one's good. He's the overcritical one. That's his thing. That's... Like, Raphael's got the attitude. Leonardo's kind of like the, not really the leader yeah. in this. I mean, like he, he wasn't really a leader. Yeah, I, he was accused of acting like the leader, but he said, like, I never said I was the leader. But then he was also he was the one who got to communicate with Splinter and like kind of got them all to get back to their training. That is what was weird. Yeah. And watching it, watching it now, that whole telepathic sequence, that was really weird. It was. I, I don't know if that was out of the comic book or if that was just something they just decided on. But it was kind of weird. Yeah. But it was it was sad, I and mean, he really felt like you know he was just saying goodbye. Like I, yeah. I don't know if I'm gonna make it, so I'm. But I am proud of you. Mm -hmm. Proud of you all. Yeah, it was it was a, it was an emotional scene. It was a good scene. I I enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed the whole movie. Uh, I think it's going to be much better than the 2014 movie. Um, it's held up for more than 20 years. Yeah. I think it will be more than adequate of a contender for the 2014 movie. Right, because I'm sure the 2014 movie is going to be old halfway through it. Listen, I can tell you, I can predict some things that are going to happen. There's going to be an explosion of some sort. There are going to be explosions. Yeah. There's going to be gunfire. Mm -hmm. The Foot Clan is not going to be uh, ninjas who've immigrated from Japan. They're going to be gun-toting soldiers. Well, when Shredder's or, not even going to be Japanese, then there's no reason for them to really be ninjas. There's no reason to stick to the source material except to have turtles in it. Right. Um, oh, I know what else is going to happen. They're not going to be main characters in their own movie. Nope. This is going to be the to, April O'Neil story. And to this day, that is what I, that is the biggest thing that when, once I heard they were making a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie and Michael Bay was going to be anywhere near it. I don't care if he's directing, producing, whatever. 
that is what I credit the 1990 movie for doing. They made the turtles the main characters in their own movie. Yeah, and you that's, can do that when you're not worried about the budget of CGI for how many scenes they could be in. Exactly. When you have the suits, they can just be in all the scenes. Yeah. And I guarantee there's going to be some kind of sex joke made at Megan Fox's expense. We're going to get a butt shot of some sort, and we're going to have a bunch of product placement, mainly a soda, uh, a soda ad, or some type of game station, or some type of vehicle. Yeah. Well, we are speaking about a movie that uh, had Domino's ever present in the movie itself, and then also struck up a pretty big product placement with Pizza Hut, which was ironic. But... Well, sure. <laughs> But you know that this type of movie is going to spawn so much product placement. It, it is, and it's going to be disgusting, and I dread it. But let's remember that the 1990 movie exists, and everyone should see that instead. If you're, if you're insisting on going to the theater, see the 1990 first. Right. And understand why it's good, folks. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think we've gone on for quite a bit. Yes, I sorry think it's about time that. to wrap. So that's all right. It was it was a good movie, and we we had we both had full lists of things we needed to discuss. Yes, sir. So came prepared. Anyway, that has been Hero Talk, everybody. And there you have it, Hero Talk enthusiasts. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you right here next time on Hero Talk.